And I'd like to invite Rina Amin, first of all, to come into our spirit circle. A practicing pharmacist, but also a practicing Hindu who does an enormous amount within the community, from her work, of course, and we were talking about the fact that she too will be planning and organizing a day very similar to today and uh, instinctively doing what she's been called to do. So please, uh, Rina, would like you to join our spirit circle. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, followed by Shola. <laughs> I would like you also, please, often dubbed as the energy doctor and author of four books, a spiritual life coach and a psychologist, a yoga teacher, has worked incredibly uh, uh, worldly, is what I would want to say, um, not just in this country, but abroad. And when you mention Deepak Chopra and, uh, <laughs> and Shoma uh, in the same sentence, you know what circles that this, uh, this uh, woman of spirit moves in. And um, thank you so much for being here in our circle. Uh, Maureen Goodman. Now Maureen is the European Program Director here. No, no, not European, just UK. But she flies everywhere. Whenever yeah. I'm speaking to her, she just come back from Mar Marrakesh, an interfaith dialogue and conference with uh, so many uh, international um, uh, delegates. And um, I know that uh, Maureen in particular, with the work that she's done with women's groups, prison groups, etc. is very committed to this idea of spirit and woman and bringing those to the fore. So thank you so much, Mary, Melita Koblin. Now I know you're here, <laughs> the very first to arrive today. And an artist extraordinaire, thank you so much for bringing me in touch with the Rumi poems which touched my heart and I know you'll be sharing that with us later on originally from Bulgaria, but with us here now and with much to share, a really creative soul and person which we are very, very fortunate to have here with us uh, today. So what we have is, as you can see, a conversation is going to about to take place amongst these four extraordinary women. And we women are going to listen in, eavesdrop. The audience, as you can see, are all around, but take note you will have an opportunity to be where I am right now, there will be a chair. And when question time arrives, you'll be sitting right here, able to join the, uh, the circle, the conversation that is taking place, to be able to contribute. And the beauty of that, of course, is getting um, everyone's views, potentially, on the question that you will be asking. Okay? So it's intimate, safe space, where all things could come up, and anything. And, um, well, I'm going to hand over to Maureen now to see where it goes. Oh, yes, to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a thought. Oh, I see. Oh, it's the uh, white against well, right. OK, you must get the colours right. Yes, you can see we're preoccupied with colour. What colour hair have you got? Oh, can I talk to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, now we've got the balance. Is that what it is? Yes, there we go. You see, balance is very important to us. Okay, so this is where I leave and Maureen takes over. So, um, okay, not so much taking over, but just supposed to start the conversation. Because um, I, I really feel women of spirit are, are needed in today's world. Women are needed, aren't they? But, uh, I, I love that uh, saying, um, women hold up half the world. You know? And uh, I know I've had many women who have inspired me in my life. And somebody mentioned Daddy Janki, of course, and who's one of the leaders of the Brahma Kumaris, who's 96, and I can think twice as quickly as I can. <laughs> uh, tremendous energy. And you know, my mother, um, who came from um, Calcutta, came to England, didn't know anything of the culture, you know, from 
very rich background and being an attic room, you know, it takes a lot of spirit to adapt and really make a go of things, which she did. But um, I, I think, I suppose what, what's meaningful for me is that these kind of women don't see any boundaries, you know? And um, I just met a woman now in Marikesh, <coughs> Marrakesh, and um, she told me her story, which really touched me. She, um, she's a professor of mathematics, and uh, she was brought up in a very poor village in Morocco somewhere. And uh, uh, women aren't generally educated. It's actually 75% illiteracy in the country, which I was surprised. And uh, when she was seven years old, it was announced in the village school that uh, they would educate girls. So she asked her father, can I go to school? So, okay. So they lined up with their birth certificates to enroll. And she got enrolled. And then after her, they said, that's it, to the rest of the line, long line waiting, <coughs> come back next year. So she said, I was that far away from being illiterate, and she became a mathematics professor. And then she said, at age 50, I left it because I was always the professor, the mother, the teacher, but never Fatima. She was searching for herself. So I just thought, you know, she didn't allow herself to be defined by her circumstances. And I think that's a very, very important uh, quality of a woman of spirit, you know. No one's going to find me. I am who I am. to be important, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me think for myself, because I come from what I started many years ago as a fashion designer. And there was a, a time when I kind of thought of fashion and clothes and colours totally not important. That was the time I decided to be spiritual. <laughs> So I thought it's not, it's kind of not important, but then kind of re-embracing that and kind of really seeing what that is in terms of color, in terms of energy, in terms of how we might express something from, you know, kind of from a deeper level and then looking at ways of really integrating that. So it's not something that is... <laughs> 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 but not some not something that's kind of external but seen as something that is something more than that and all, and also important in terms of how we express but also how women express you know what that means and why we might not have the right colours when we go to the wardrobe. Because energetically we're trying to express something that maybe is not there in the wardrobe. So there's some kind of deeper focus as well to that. So, so I like that, I wanted to say that. <laughs> and I like something else you said um, about this woman that after achieving family and career and all that, she had to start reading and finding who she is. And I think um, it's, for me, it's been always the main thing that you don't stay in one place. And once in an airport being stuck you know, for five hours, I sat next to a woman I didn't know. And we talk, start talking after an hour. And she told me something which I never forgot. And I see that this has been a guiding line in my life. She said that she, her guru is a woman who has been um, married three times, but the husband died, all of them. And she has moved in New Jersey now. 
And she said, um, she's now 90, and she looks very young, and she's with all her capacities. And then she asked her, what do you do to keep? So she said, oh, you have always to try to learn something that you don't know. And it's, it's, she goes every year, she decides that, for example, she wants to find out about the painter. So she goes in all libraries and finds, then goes and visits places. Or anything that she learns, or language, one year is language. So everything you don't know, she starts. And I think this is very important for, like, keep, keep all this good curiosity that we have as children, which later life takes away. And it's been kind of my story of life, because I started as a musician, then a painter, then a writer, and everything that I don't know, I continue struggling, so it's very interesting. Yeah. And coming back to your point about this particular lady who had achieved so much, but yet had found that in her personal life she hadn't quite achieved or flourished. And I think quite a lot of us might resonate personally, I think, is what is success? How do we define success? I mean, is it success? She thought because in her village, girls were not given the opportunity to educate, yet here she is a professor of mathematics, which is no mean feat. Uh, so she's at the epitome of her professional career. <coughs> but is she sort of benchmarking her success to what society wants to hear? Or then she's going to be disappointed. But if she had put the measure of her success to her own belief, to her own self, then I think what we started off earlier in, what, what is thriving, what is flourishing, then I think she would have attained that inner peace. Along, along the way, sort of. Along the way. And yeah. I think women do struggle because in this day and age, we are expected or we feel compelled to succeed professionally, spiritually, culturally, within your own homes. But somewhere along the line, we forget ourselves. And I think today is a fantastic opportunity that so many of us have actually put our daily lives on hold and come here. Uh, I mean, I think I feel humbled just sitting here, because I'm sure every woman here is a woman of spirit. But at the end of the day, we're here to learn and share whatever each one of us can give. And I think we get lost in translation sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about success. Then I, I also think that what it means, what success means for us, actually changes. That it's not just one fixed thing that you achieve and then, okay, you had that success. You don't need to do whatever it is again, but that it's something, it could be all the things that you said, but at different times. So also kind of, you know, recognizing what is success for us at any given time. So are you trying to say that um, some of it might be uh, associated with the opportunities that one gets in order to success? Somebody mentioned about latent skills and abilities. But if one never gets that opportunity, how do you harness that? And I think sometimes we all need that opportunity or even an opening. Otherwise, it is extremely difficult to get even to some stage of even recognition within ourselves or whoever else we're working with. But I, I, think, I think one of the things that came up when I was speaking with Deborah in terms of what it is to flourish was what came, actually came to my mind was Maya Angelou, who wrote the poem, Still Again I Rise. So for me, it was about continuing to show up, continuing to come back. So regardless of what happens in our lives, that we're able to rise, to still come back. And so that for me is also about asking questions so that we might ask a question to ourselves of what is success. So it may have been so. I mean, raising children, not that, that stops, but coming to at the, at the, early, you know, the early kind of stages of that, then what success is is going to be very different from maybe finding oneself you know, late, later on, if that's how 
you know, that some things are in someone's particular <coughs> journey. So I see it as something that will change and that we're able to <coughs> keep coming back, keep showing up and keep asking the questions as well. I totally concur. I think resilience is an absolutely fundamental and women who, I think women all, have shown resilience in something or the other. Your point about, you know, if you're knocked down, you get up and go again. But, you know, there are times where you think, I've just about had enough. But somehow women, it's in their DNA to, to, to keep going. There's really a tremendous amount of tolerance and resilience. And I think that's something that we're going to interesting for me that I really started the spiritual path in earnest at, well, a bit before 21, but with the Brahma Kumaris at age 21. And so really all my life experience has been here, really, um, because up until that time I kind of studied, but, you know, I hadn't really, you, you think you know everything at 21, but you don't really. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it's been interesting to integrate the spiritual development with the external tasks that have been in front of me. And it, there have been many, many opportunities, many things. Um, and that's, that's taken me time to learn, actually. Um, so I think that's, the, that's the, the big challenge, integration of what's happening inside with what you're expressing outside. And both are important, absolutely. I do feel that. I think it's kind of like success. You were talking about different, yes, I agree with this. But there is success and contentment, which is, success is something which is demanded, or very often we have to obey from outside. It's a demand that your parents do, you have to succeed in this, or have success, have career, have something to be somebody. But I think the real, Success is contentment, is to be happy with who you are and to be self-sufficient in a way inside yourself. And I think this is very different. Mm. Um, yeah. And also spirit, when I think I sometimes wonder if the division between spiritual life or, or life is right, because I think everything is one. Um, and there's a lot, yes. And this division also creates tension very often that you have to become spiritual, which actually why everybody does yeah. Greek and it really. Mm. Yeah. Because it brings us right back to integration. Yeah. It's the kind of ultimate yeah. thing that we're actually able to do that. Um, and it is the ultimate thing, really trying to integrate. We are all spiritual, as you say, but, but quite often we have a spiritual practice or we have something that is yeah. deemed to be spiritual that we do yeah. or that maintains our spirit. And that needs to be integrated with what we have to do every day that may create some busyness. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, that's what <laughs> Spiritually, you know, spiritually, everything is an illusion, and so we can be content with that knowledge, but then we still may need to be somewhere at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yeah. 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 So, that's that's responsibility. Mm. So how do we hold, it's part of hold the space for that? Okay. Well, I was just going to say, um, like Janky, who we keep referring to, uh, she said at one point, if you're busy, you're lazy. But she meant, you know, if you're in that frame of mind of busyness, you, you've got yourself too involved and <coughs> you're not paying attention, you're lazy to pay attention to your thoughts and feelings and your, your self-esteem and who you are, your connection with God or, you know, so that was a, a you know, a phrase that really through me when I first heard it, but when I began to think about it, I didn't like it, but then... <laughs> <laughs> so how, how does a woman actually find the balance? Because, you know, we are all here, we all believe that there is some 
spiritual connection, something that we hold on, that um, our faith, um, our beliefs, uh, our upbringing allows us to thrive. Yet at the same time, we're, we have that consciousness that we do need to invest in ourselves. But finding that balance, how, how do you guys do it? Because you do know you have to do it, but you struggle. If I can use your word, because we're lazy for ourselves, but busy for the society. I mean, I, I can really kind of hear what you're saying in terms of being able, I mean, for myself, I can be very content and have been for a lot of my life. But I can also see where there are times where that contentment as well, in some ways, has stopped me from showing up. Because I can be, I'm fine, I'm content with whatever it is. But, you know, that was okay for that time. So I can, I can acknowledge that as well. But I can also see that an aspect of that, or an element of that, also there's a time for that to change. So that, which is why I'm talking about keep asking the questions. So I can, rather than being content, I can step up as well in a different kind of way around a particular area. So, you know, I can see the kind of need for, for all of that. I know that certainly in my life, sometimes being content um, is only been part, part of it. I can step up as well as being content. Yes, it's, it's, it's a balance. Because it's not contentment about going to sleep, uh, but it is. It is exactly this, this wanting always to do something new, to do a more, to be somewhere and go. Yes. For you know, it's like um, you can have that drive inside that you, you know, and I do feel that I, I, I like to do something new, to learn something new, to take on a challenge. Sometimes you think, oh my goodness, is, is this what you wanted me to do? But you know, there you are. Um, and, and that that stretches you. But you don't necessarily need to lose your contentment in a sense. There's a kind of um, contentment in knowing that you're doing the right thing to move you forward. You know, it's, it's not a complacency in the right thing, maybe. But I, I know what you mean, you know, you can, if you reach a plateau and you think, you know, well, oh, I'm doing quite well now. Wow, well, you know, you're going to stagnate and stop that. You can't, because you're pushed out. Of that place. <laughs> <laughs> you're really pushed out immediately. I think you're not allowed. I think that is the good thing. I think personally for me, um, I believe that um, the spiritual development of personal contentment comes from the ability to know that you are here to do something good. I know it sounds a bit pompous, but I don't mean it in that way. Um, we we feel like. A lot of us are fortunate because of our upbringing or whatever abilities we have and we made up our lives. But there are lots of women out there who actually could use our help. And likewise, in doing that, you're actually learning a lot from them. And you know, it's like sharing good practice kind of thing. Um, and I, I feel, is that contentment? Because even if I have to give my evenings, my weekends to sort of, you know, work as a community to sort of bring awareness of whatever issues, concerns the women face today. For me, that would be a really good contentment. Um, but also, you know, I feel like, um, do we owe some kind of uh, responsibility to the generation that's coming behind <coughs> us? Um, we had our grandmothers, our mothers, who motivated us and uh, you know women across the world um, both past present and maybe in future they will but what are we doing today um, and in, in the west it is really quite difficult because of the influences our children have um, and sometimes do you lead by example do you actually practice what you preach or do you just say okay that's where i cut off there are more questions than answers, I totally agree, but uh, I'm pretty sure that somebody will have an answer. <laughs> so. I, I also think we have, we do have a responsibility to do, but I also think, particularly as women, 
mothers, there's a responsibility, well maybe not responsibility, but I think we can also be, because in that being, we're also teaching, if you like, all of those that are watching. One of the things that I say when I'm training is at any time, somebody is watching what you're doing and they're learning from what it is that you're actually doing. So you could be saying anything, but they're actually watching what you do and they're learning from that. And so sometimes for women, where we may have ourselves um, kind of on the end of the list, but maybe not even in the equation at all sometimes, to elevate that awareness and to be on the list and to allow energy to be coming in and really supporting and taking care of self, someone is watching that and learning that they can do the same thing from us, giving that energy, giving that attention and focus and love really, that self, self-love and particularly uh, particularly children and I need to say as well particularly girl children because that's where they're going to be learning that from. So are you saying we need to learn to accentuate our priorities? No, no, I'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> we can also just be. Yes, I understand what you're saying. I have the experience with my children as well. Very often in, in trying to be good and good mother, good this, good the other. You lose yourself. And I think this is the I think this is the primary responsibility. And I did not give up my profession when I had children and, and it was very difficult really. And my daughter, nobody wanted to hear anything about what I had to say. The books I gave them or you know I dragged them to classes and things. And for a long time I thought, God, what, who did I give birth to? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there's really no connection here, what is happening? But actually, uh, my daughter refused to, to, do, uh, to read anything I gave her. So for a long time, I suffered from that. But now, um, when I go to her house, whatever she does is what I cooked. She never wanted to learn, but my behavior. And then I had the thank you from my children, both of them, a few years ago, to my great surprise and pleasure. Uh, they said, thank you very much, ma'am, for not living through us. You have your own life, and we respect that, and thank you for giving us the example. And in that sense, I do believe that being is more important yes. than preaching. So whatever you preach doesn't go anywhere. But being it, embodying it, yes. That's absolutely, that's how people yeah. learn, they don't learn from what you say, yeah. absolutely, and they watch you, they, they test you. Yeah. Yeah. But also the other thing is when you want people to move in a certain direction, yes, they don't, <laughs> they go in the opposite <laughs> direction. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, later on they realise the value, you know, yes, and you, you have to wait in preparation. My wife here also not the cooking, but I hear conversations with my daughter, which I hear my words. <laughs> it's a fantastic feeling. <laughs> <laughs> like a clone of you. There's <laughs> <laughs> hope for everyone. Yeah, it's amazing. I don't think they will think me if they heard me talking now. <laughs> Nobody is here. So I'm a mother of two boys, yes. and uh, I, I sometimes think. Um, a lot of the, my friends who, who don't have a full-time job and things, and quite often, I think women are humble, and uh, you say, if you're with other friends or strangers, or you've gone to a conference, or you may, they say, what do you do? And they say, oh, I, I'm a housewife. But I think you are bringing up two children who are going to be the citizens of mm. the future. They're going to be fantastic human beings. Why do you undermine that role of being a mom? Um, you don't have to sort of benchmark everybody with what they do, or, but being a mother, as you say, is a lifelong responsibility. But success it, creates the Yeah, other. and uh, I think we've got to give them that space yeah. to thrive in whatever they, they think. Uh, but it, it's really important. But nice that you have a clone. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll never have a clone, they're two boys. <laughs> well, it lasts. <laughs> I don't think there is um, a more important job than raising the next generation. I mean, it is. You know, you can't have any doctors and lawyers and everything that is deemed to be valuable and important without mothers who raised, you know, who raised those children. And more even important than human beings. Yes. Before doctors, yes. when yeah, human absolutely. beings and really Someone has to raise them. And I was also, at, I've um, written an article that's for International Women's Day. It was written some years ago, but I've kind of put it back out. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that it, that it says is that behind every, every man, there's mm -hmm. usually a, oh, yeah. a good woman. Mm -hmm. But I would say, no, we can also take it a little bit further in that no man can even get here at all. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'd like to add to that. <laughs> it's a quote. <laughs> it's a quote by Mahatma Gandhi, and I think everybody knows is educate a woman and you educate the nation. And I think, I don't mean academic education, I think the whole human yeah. being, the spiritual development. The role women have to play is so important, and uh, I think um, uh, the founder of the Brahman Kumaris, putting women in front as spiritual leaders and teachers, um, he was very far-sighted in doing that, and it's it's um, I think it's it's made a huge difference. It's a different kind of leadership, um, you know, leadership which is really a nurturing kind of leadership, and. Uh, the extent that um, one of the we had a gathering of gurus and you know mahatmas and so on at our headquarters in India once, and uh, one of the gurus said, "Well, can your sisters come and run my ashram because you do such a good job?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, there's something about the way women lead, and if if, if women feel you know we feel that courage, and I remember when. I first was really faced with taking decisions. I, I realized I'd never really taken decisions for myself, you know, as a young woman. I was relied on somebody, a husband, a father, you know. And it was it felt a bit like um, I'm not a swimmer, but you know, I could imagine when you're about to dive off a diving board into the you know, so and I thought, no, well, I'm gonna take this decision and then okay, yes, I, I want to stay connected with God so that it's the right decision, it's good, it's the right energy, but then, whatever it is, I'm going to stand by that and, you know, and it was like, you know, it was frightening, you know, and um, then you, you just learn how how many resources you have inside, we have so much inside of us, and we have that little commentary going on saying, oh no, no, you know, you know that's the commentary you've got to say. And Shut health, up, you know. <laughs> the health and safety commentary. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a that. very damaging <laughs> effect on them. Because actually there is another thing <laughs> that prevents development, I think, today is um, over protection, over safety, mm. over, uh, over everything. Mm. Like when you say diving from a boat, I'm very glad that <laughs> <laughs> I did dive. Um, and it, I'm very, very grateful to my parents because I was educated in the communist area, which was a um, really ter terrible regime. Nobody could get out, and I was given the chance to go to study abroad. And I remember this is my first funeral. I died because I never regained and uh, never came back to my country. But my father at the station, which was like funeral because everybody I knew, friends, family, with flowers, I f and I was alone with fifteen dollars in my pocket, going to Italy without language or knowing anybody. Um, he said to me on the when I'm, I was crying, 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 uh, and I climbed the train, and he said, the last words he said, "Sweep the streets, but live in freedom. Yeah. Never come back." <laughs> And I went to the thing, and I felt like being thrown out on the boat, yes, exactly, in the unknown. 
And I'm so grateful for that because it was hard, but I did the last step and I had parents who said, go, die, die if you want, but you have to, that was, and I then looking now after so many years here, how much people are protected. They don't even have, yes. um, they have to have helmets even to, to <laughs> 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 Sometimes you think, uh, I'm not against human rights, like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, <laughs> but some of it is just absolutely against your common sense grain, and you think, how can this be? It's like, how do you want to extrapolate the, the bits from this law that, that can suit your needs? And um, I totally agree that uh, as a child, we were all left to play and to sort of climb trees. And, yeah. You know, and we had a childhood. Yes, we had. Children. Uh, but even with my own children, I put my hand up. Can't play in the front. Only the back garden. Yes. Can't go here. Yes. Is there anybody? Don't talk to strangers. When you get there, text me or ring me. Even at the age of twenty-one. Send back. My children grew without that because it wasn't fashionable then. <laughs> But another thing, second thing, is the health concern, is the fear of sufferance. Mm. Fear of suffering, which actually I think is one of the important um, things in development. You suffer for anything, to learn something, you, you have to sacrifice something, you have to give your um, evening self. And for me, the spiritual woman who um, was like a spiritual mother for me was a Spanish woman who nearly died when she was 17 of tuberculosis. And then she lost one um, lung, which was a good lung, and li lived with one that was diseased all life. And she lived to create um, all their symphonies, what was houses for children without parents or with deranged parents. And she had 80 children, and she couldn't have children herself. And she was an amazing woman. She said to me, um, she took me to the place where she nearly died in Davos. And she said, I'm so grateful that I had this illness. I said, oh, what? what do you mean? She said, I would have been superficial. I was very good at golf, at, at games. Um, she was, she said, I love dancing and society life. I would have never been the person that I became. And I never, uh, that she was really my enormous, uh, she created a great thing in Spain. I totally concur. I think women thrive in adversity. Mm -hmm. So if you are faced with challenges, yeah. that yeah. makes you she more, did more stronger. Yeah. Overcome everything. Yeah. Yeah. And we've all got life experiences which absolutely. we can relate to. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, what a fantastic place in which to, to pause um, and invite the audience um, to partake of this conversation which has touched on so many areas from just being to rising, adversity and strength. Now, so anyone before we proceed any further who would like to join the conversation with a question. Just a question. It's not a comment. <laughs> so anything that you were sitting there and thinking, oh God, is anybody going to ask this question? This is your chance. There, ha ha. Thank you. Please join us. And don't be afraid to count us. Oh dear. <laughs> In which case, um, your question um, you want to say from there. It's a reach. I was thinking about being able to take on the responsibilities and um, facing them no matter what the challenge is, but how much of that is in yourself or how much do you try to connect with that spirit in within yourself and to, I don't know what's the word, to create 
to be, to become stronger? <coughs> How much do you rely on your spirit, your spiritual energy, and I don't know, maybe prayer or meditation, and just how do, you know, because that can make you stronger, and I think that helps you. Okay, thank you, and that can be whoever feels inspired to speak first. We have time to hear from everyone if you have a view. I think it's, it's, um, it depends on the... Uh, okay. <laughs> So the, yes, I, we are all equals. Come and hear your response. Yes, it's for you. Your question. Thank you. Welcome. I think uh, that inner belief um, is very crucial or very important for you um, in, in situations when you are faced with very difficult life-changing situations. It's your faith that sort of comes to the surface. Um, and sort of for self-belief, that, that you have to have that confidence that I can do this. Um, and your faith uh, in God or in his spiritual practices, your prayers actually then show you a path, how, how to take it. And quite often you have this, um, you know, conflicting things in your mind. Why is it happening to me? Um, why me? Or why now? But sometimes in years to go, when you've actually overcome that hurdle, you think, no, that was actually what was meant to be. And because of that, I'm a better person or I've achieved something. And for me, I think doing prayers, doing my mantras that I do, actually shows me the path to take. It's not easy, I can't really relate it to you, but I think having that inner belief and self-confidence sometimes is all you need. <coughs> I've learned to rely on that very, very much, actually, because um, I, I don't think I could move ahead without that <coughs> spiritual strength inside. Um, I would be totally overwhelmed by it. Um, I, I've really worked on myself to make myself strong in this regard because otherwise I was a very shy, sensitive little flower, you know, and uh, um, I found it difficult to face things, but um, it's been the spiritual strength that's helped me to move forward in life. And it's, um, it, it, it's about what you do with your mind, really. Of course, it's a spiritual practice, whatever your practice is, and for me it's meditation in the morning, in the evening, and so on. But even throughout the day, how am I using my mind? Because my thoughts are my energy. And so if I'm keeping my thoughts elevated, seeing the best out of the situation, or perhaps, you know, if there is somebody behaving in a way that's difficult for me to tolerate, perhaps to think about, let me understand, what is that person going through, what's the pain within them, rather than instantly judging. You know, the, how you use your, your thinking, you know, is very, very crucial. But you may need to recharge. I, I need to recharge daily. And then I can do whatever I need to do. It becomes easy. Definitely. Um, I think, for me, personally, it's been a progressive development. Like when uh, I told you this being thrown off the boat in arriving in Italy and not knowing anything. Um, I didn't know, I didn't have uh, faith or meditation practice or nothing then. But I think we have life force. And I remember that someday was a voice saying, you can do that, you can do that. Even before I knew that there is, you can do that. At least you can learn Italian. It was my my mantra, at least you can learn Italian. And then it continues, and of course you encounter practices, you encounter, but I think belief is, have faith in the spirit that is inside you, that you know or you don't know, but it's there, and it is always there. If you want so it's to do with my kind of spiritual essence. Well, that is 
also fortified, if you like, as well by how I'm thinking or how I how I see things. I was raised to believe that uh, you can do anything that you put your mind to, and I believe that. I don't think it's true, but I believe it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's something that's kind of always, always um, stayed with me. And uh, one of the teachings that I heard that I've also found very powerful for me was to get down on your knees and say your prayers and then get up and answer them. And so for me, it's about that balance of really trusting and just knowing that all is well and having a real trust. Just kind of knowing that actually it's fine, whatever it's going to be, <coughs> just fine. But then at the same time, doing what I need to do as well to, to support that. And for me, that's a spiritual practice that consists of, it's a physical practice as well, of asana and kind of yoga practices, as well as meditation, as well as what's going on in my head, as well as what I'm eating. All of those things will allow me to, um, to face whatever it is that I, that I really need to deal with, whether that's an up or whether that's a down. It's the same to me, I know it's okay, either way. Thank you so much for that, thank you. So you can see, and thank you for being brave enough to come into the circle, and we'd like to invite someone else. Yes, do come and join us. Question? Thank you. It's not a question, but is this my thoughts turn? <laughs> question? Um, okay, you, you have a thought. Yeah. Okay, come part of the conversation and so um, I, uh, something was mentioned about uh, taking risks in life uh, I, I do agree with that that uh, you have to take risks in, uh, in life in us uh, so there's always a first time and uh, I think it's the way to you learn like uh, to give an example even my eight-year-old daughter like you know she's uh, quite getting interested in taking a first step to learn cooking. So, you know, that's the, uh, we get worried about you know, being close to the gas, to the stove, and things like that. Mm. Mm. Yes, but she's not going to learn how to cook if she doesn't get close to the gas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the health and safety helps. Yeah. How they do it makes a difference. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. And it's the trust and with guidance being there. And you not know, taking it's, it's about not just, you know, you could say you trust in general, but if she's got that thing to do to that, to trust her, her instinct, instinct yeah, you know? Absolutely. But that's like giving regard to her as a being. Because if you see her as an eight-year-old, oh, you know? yeah. if you see her as a being that's come to you, that you trust that, that special being that's with me. Absolutely. Thank you for that. You've come for a couple more questions. So... Do feel free, as you were talking there, as people are probably getting their thoughts together, the importance of uh, choosing what you wear, uh, the colours <laughs> were being discussed earlier on, reminded me also of the importance of choosing your thoughts first thing <coughs> in the morning. and there were lots of things that were said in the circle just now that reminded me of that, that to reframe and to set your state first thing. Just like how you frame and set what colour you're going to wear, it can affect, of course, your day. So, yes, fantastic. Two more points, but we'll have yours first and then, then your second. Thank you, but you must, I've been told, to insist that you come into the circle. Thank you so much. Yes. There was a question about the responsible, sorry, about the balance between spirituality and the normal life. I couldn't get more clarity on it. Can you just share more about it? Ah, clarity on it. Yes. We'll start from wherever. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a question we all have. And I think we are on a different journey. 
and a different level of attainment. Um, we know where we want to go. That is the first step of realization. Um, at least we've had some idea that this is where I want to go. However, we live in society. We have conflicting priorities. We also have a huge amount of responsibilities. Um, and we can't just neglect that. It, that, is not, that is not an option. However, I think what we have to do is find um, some time in sort of 24 hours in a week or whatever to just set that personal time. We've realized where we want to go. It's not easy, but um, we've got to find something. And that is a conscious realization that gives an hour a day, even if it's at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night, that's my protected time. Do not let anybody come. You've done all your responsibilities, all your chores, whatever women in 21st century still have to do it. But you give that <laughs> hour at the end of the day or at the end of the week that you tell your family, please respect, that's the time for me. And I think if they realize that you are giving everything as a mother, as a wife, as a daughter, as a daughter in law, whatever, I don't think they will argue that you, this isn't acceptable. But you've got to be bold <coughs> in demanding that. Thank you. Yes, I don't I think, um, e Each one of us knows our condition inside, you know, to what extent we have that clarity, to what extent we feel connected with God and with our own inner selves. And I think we all know that when we are, do feel connected, how much more productive we are. So it's in a sense, not either or, you know, in a sense it's, um, uh, I, I know for me, I need to do that in the early morning. That's really, really important. So it's like starting the day with that. Um, but there's the faith, and it's a faith based on direct experience, that if I start the day in the right way, that energy stays with me. So I actually will get a lot more done in a practical, physical sense. It's as if time kind of extends itself, and I wonder how is that possible? But it's because um, I'm approaching the day with that clarity, with that feeling of God's love, with that feeling of, like you say, everything's okay. You know? So I, I need and this whole thing that we mentioned of setting this up in the morning and then let me be fully responsible. I think that's so important in, spirit, in the spiritual life. Whatever I do, let me do it fully, my son, my mind, and that all I have to be spiritual and you know, it doesn't matter if I don't wash the dishes. You know, that's not spirituality to me. Somebody gave me a lovely phrase and said, Spirituality is about how you tie your shoelaces in the way. So, and it's about the little things that reflect So to be fully responsible to be fully spiritual. I think that goes to that saying, um, I don't know, it's a Zen saying, I think. Before enlightenment, you wash potatoes, and after enlightenment, you wash potatoes. <laughs> 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 Uh, I have been a musician, and I, um, you know, that is a demand, demands that you are in touch with both worlds all the time. For me, at least, it was. But one thing of that now I'm trying to do, which this division between spiritual life or normal life, which I, I feel it's less and less. It doesn't exist really. It's in the mind. It's this. I think it was Paul Mavrumi that I love very much. Um, I will paraphrase because I have no memory to remember everything. But um, it was that if you live with this feeling that your eyes are the eyes of God, your hands are the, uh, the hands of God, your um, everything that you are, your ears are the eyes of God, if you listen in that way, then lots of things change and you start seeing the well, differently, uh, and it takes discipline. So it's not for me. It's now become not the meditation, which is specially designed, which I was doing, but trying to keep that to the day 
as a way of life, as a way of passing from moment to moment. Mm. Like now, who talks? I don't know. You see, it's, that, that's how I see it. Mm. For me, it's also about um, creating ease. So it's about uh, what I also call kind of energy economy. It's making sure that I'm not putting out too much yes. energy and at least the energy that's coming in allows for what's got to go out. And so spiritual practice is important, but it's called spiritual practice for a reason, because it's practicing. <coughs> so, so, being, being, yes. so, it's to, so it's to practice being able to, um, what one of my teachers called, well in the Chinese system it's called Wu Wei, and I was taught uh, in action, in action, so that we're, we're learning to work in a way that is, yeah, you're not using as much energy for it. And so I know for me that if I start my day with my thoughts focused, with my spiritual practice, and it's going to make the rest of the day a whole lot easier. And some of it, some of it, I don't do it anyway. I just, I just allow it, allow it to be done. So some things, if you like, you said with the, with the ears of God, if you like. Certainly, my kind of creative work is about capturing it when it happens. So I would never sit down to write a book, for example. It's, that's too difficult to sit down and I'm going to write a book now. I can't imagine how that can happen. <laughs> but if I can allow that book to, to be written, and then I'll capture it as it comes by being in a quiet place or being in a still place, then it makes it easy. Then that can happen. But I think the other way, trying to, um, in, in Nigeria we say you can't push a river. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to add, listening, is some of the things we do, it is second nature. So it is like um, integration versus introspection. Integration, I mean, is your spirituality, your spiritual life, your practices that are related to your spirit, is almost integrated in your daily life. So when I do, I have my shower in the morning when I wake up and I do my puja and, you know, that's how my day starts. But my last hour at night, just before I go to bed, is introspection. What have I done today? How can I improve? What did go well? What did not go well? How can spiritual, how can my faith in God help me make better decisions? Um, and that kind of personal introspection is in your protected time. And I think it's difficult, but it, it's a practice most of us do during the day, like you're saying. Different. You do it yeah. very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're moving already into the next session as to what it is that you individually do, but thank you for sparking that up. I do want to honour the last person who did raise their hand and have a question, and this is going to be a challenge to our guests to answer very succinctly, literally a line. So your question, would you like to please come and ask it in a circle? And we are going to still have our tea time. It won't be half an hour, but more like 20 minutes. But while our uh, second, uh, um, fourth questioner comes to the Yes, do, yes. Mine is not a question, but I want to share. <laughs> 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 right, so nothing for you to then respond to, so even shorter. Good, thank you. Thank you for allowing me. I'm sharing my spiritual talk to, with you all. My name is Debeti Asapoide. I think the same, they know me. I've been here, I ran charity for 25 years. Just to make it short, after just when I was leaving, you know, Canada, I think it's about 10, my brother called and I said, Brad, in my language, three. I said, yeah, then you have If you say, yeah, my mom brought you here up, we have to tell God how our parents brought us up. And then I left. I said, I'm getting late. Now, to make the law and let you all know the spiritual is you. I've run charity for 25 years, they know. One day I had a phone call. We got our own building, which I built through the God who asked me, because talent differs. 
and all is well and good. I always tell people, we all can never become uh, artists or uh, uh, singers or footballers, but still, we all have a special gift. But when we wake up, do we ask ourselves, what is my gift? Even if I'm a footballer, we are 11, they will call one person name, blah, blah, blah. Does that make you jealous? <coughs> now, can you imagine an African woman? Everybody is rushing to Africa to help them because we are poor. <laughs> I've done charity for 25 years. I've got my own center through the National Lottery. People like them, they come and give us things. One morning I had a call. Borough of Brent is demolishing the center because, no, they have constipated the center because the land belongs to them. Can you imagine? We rush there, we are not allowed to be there. In the entry, my cater for every disabled youth, everybody. Now here is the beautiful part. We decided with the spirit, inner spirit, that we should be there like today, to pray. We were holding candles. Bulldozers were there. They were bulldozing the building which has cost nearly one million. All that I said to myself with the people praying is, Lord, you are the Alpha. You are the Omega. You are the beginning. You are the ending, Lord. And I wept. When I said I didn't cry, I'm a liar, because even Jesus wept. But with the faith within me, I realized there are bigger things. Because when we sow a seed, like one uh, fruit, a seed of orange or something, the pit, we call it, one, but what does it happen? Can somebody ask them? We, today, I just put one orange seed here. In two years, I'm not going to get orange. Can anybody answer me? Orange. Thank you. So please, let me tell you all, perseverance, motivation, willpower, and let me tell you all. So just December, they called me, I came home. I was crying. I had a call from home. I said, I want to kill myself. They said, Ben, you are four people. I said, yeah, I want to go mental. They said, and, and it is true, because I don't have a house, I live in a council flat, I can't pay, I'm not on salary. I'm telling you the truth, and I've been here since my childhood. Then the inner spirit will say, child, don't you know after a rain comes the sunshine? After a night comes day, and tears returning smiles. Then I woke up and start singing. You know, going. <laughs> <laughs> you see? But to conclude that beautiful thing, they spoke to me about 12 o'clock. By 3. Back, what are you doing? <laughs> hey, hey, wipe away the tears. Go to uh, Heathrow Terminal 3. Uh, your ticket number is this. I said, eh? <laughs> I have to ask in my language. I said, but the inner spirit has told me after rain comes what? Sunshine. After night comes rain, and after tears comes love. Now I wish. <laughs> okay, I'm holding my right hand. I just um. went. <laughs> I just went to the Heathrow. Went home. This is to share inner inner, inner gifts. Look, everybody were donating me land, plot, everything. Mission Dying Club, I'm going to invite you all, Brother Kumari people, to come down. Say amen. 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 There is a spirit. When you have the inner spirit, every disappointment becomes a blessing. And this has been my fruit since the first of August when Brent Council demolished a building of one million for no reason because they said the land belongs to them but i told them i came with nothing i will go with nothing but the beautiful thing god has given me wherever i go everybody likes me and I <laughs> <laughs> thank you so so much thank you so much for sharing those little jewels i love of the night comes day after tears come laughter and let us not forget that there is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. There is never just that moment where it's all, it feels like it's all lost and there's a lot of pain. Thank you so much. I would get into so much trouble. I don't think I'm going to give them this job again because I should have got you off for tea five minutes ago. But it was a wonderful way in which to finish that conversation. And we invited 
that contribution. So thank you so much for sharing and being brave enough to share. So thank you very much indeed. I like the sort of spontaneous applause not only for those that came into the circle, but those who contributed so openly with all of your experiences. And we do have now an opportunity just to reflect, as I promised you. I went many times, six times in the desert. I love the desert because it empties your mind and it brings everything to the essential when you find peace. So this is my impression of Sahara. <clears throat> I love the Sahara. <coughs> the eyes gaze out, gaze out in the emptiness and find nothing to reflect it. In the sheer silence, the soundless wind that comes from nowhere and is going nowhere, all impressions of our world are wiped out in an instant. In the air so rarefied and pure, the stars look close and bright, so much so that one can pick them like ripe apples. Drifting to sleep on the sand under the, their gaze is like being pulled up, floating disembodied in vast emptiness. Then you start and come back, comforted by the imposing silhouette of the camel set against the sky. The nights are cold, the midday sun is cruel, devouring all in its fiery grip. In the desert, the Bedouins are the kings, slender and graceful in their jalaba, growing pots of tea on the fire, appearing with hands full of twigs and disappearing in the darkness is like witnessing some ritualistic dance of ancient priests. One night, one particularly memorable night, memorable night, I woke up suddenly and stood up gripped by the tremendous spectacle in front of my eyes. In the cold moon night, the dunes appeared like frozen waves of the silver sea. The clouds rushed from the sky as if called for an urgent meeting beyond the horizon. The desert seemed like a colossal stage set for some mysterious plays of the god to be about to be performed. Captivated, I sat on the top of a dune wrapped in my burnous and watched until sunrise through the final curtain. <coughs> I asked the moon, tell me how many are the grains of sand in the desert? The moon was playing hide and seek, peeping in and out of the feathery clouds. Tell me how many are the grains of sand in the desert? Silence. Then softly at first, I heard laughter. The stars were falling about laughing, twinkling and sparkling. Tell me, how many are the grains of sand in the desert? As many as we are, you better start counting. They did <coughs> mischievously, during my glass, glance into the sky, vibrant with layer upon layer of stars, <coughs> and beyond them, millions more, pulsating and spilling as if the sky were a cup turned upside down upon the sand. How many are the stars in heaven? Oh, don't start again. Total silence. Every rustle, every sound in the, weather, in the desert is amplified. The whisper of the wind, the bird cries, the heart beat, silently dragging dunes and clouds in their silver net towards her bed. The moon moved slowly until it sank beyond the horizon, leaving faint glow behind. And then a nearly dry darkness enveloped the desert. Every living creature stone and grain of sand seem to hold their breath, waiting. Shrouded in darkness, the dunes lay motionless under the starless sky. Time stood still. Cold wind blew suddenly from nowhere as if carrying death on its chilling wings. I saw myself from above, a tiny shivering dot lost in the vastness. Silence. Then an unpredictable quiver in the air signaled the end of waiting. A narrow strip of light appeared in the horizon, defined as the threshold between the arrival of the day and the withdrawal of the night. Meanwhile, the Bedouins in their black jalaba rose from the sand and scattered in all directions. Vertical black shadows moving swiftly towards the reddening horizon, until suddenly they melted into the sound, sand for the morning prayer, before beginning the hard day's work. Hidden under heaps of branches, they reemerged as soon as the red tongues of fire rose in the sky, with their heads forming a black circle around the fire and began the ritual of making bread. 
In the morning, fresh breeze, the day newly born, stepped boldly onto the sound and chased the last remaining shadows beyond the horizon. How sad, I thought, grateful for the warmth of the sun on my back, that the birth of countless days passed unnoticed as we sleep sealed in brick houses in our concrete towns. One day, sleeping the silk sound through my fingers, I ask again, tell me how many are the grains of sand? And a little grain whispered to me the tale of the sands. I may be minute, but my story is eons old. I was a mighty rock once, hidden in the earth's womb. I have slept millions of years on the bottom of the ocean. I know the name of every fish and shell. I have burned in the furnace of fire and have frozen time and time <clears throat> until crumbled into stone. Tossed by hurricanes and melted by lavas, cracked and swept by floods, I learned patience. I have passed through endless transformations and crumbled more and more until I became so tiny that I forgot having ever been the mighty rock. Shall I tell you my secret? Now I'm happy to be nothing, a pliable dust for the winds to weave their intricate pattern, patterns upon me because I have become a soft carpet on which God walks. but thank you for bringing it so close to us today. It allows us to move seamlessly to uh, Sister Maureen's uh, daily practice. Thank you. I want to share that what is very meaningful to me is my relationship with the divine, with God. And I want to do everything that I can in my life to maintain that relationship in a living way. And I won't go through a meditation now, we will do that later, but just to describe that the meeting with God for me begins first thing in the morning and we meditate very early at 4 a.m. and often I come here to this house or I'm at home a few <coughs> minutes away and that's a very, <coughs> very sweet time of meeting and to meet God you have to first of all be in your own awareness as a soul, as a being of light. And then <coughs> the energy is right. Your awareness is set for that connection with God as a being of light and as an unlimited source of love and <coughs> peace and compassion and wisdom. And there are certain thoughts as well through the day that help me to keep that elevated awareness. And at different times in my development, I've used different thoughts. But at the moment, there's some that are very meaningful. And so first related to the consciousness of the soul. It's something that I was told and then I practiced deeply for some months. That when you sit in the early morning, let your original qualities emerge. Let your self-respect emerge. So the love, the peace, the joy, the truth in you, let that emerge. You know, when you just keep a thought, something happens. And in terms of 
coping with the things that happen during the day because we have all the challenges. There's another thought um, that's very meaningful for me, this point, that every second that passes is the drama of life. So that second is gone and you can't repeat it, so the next second is new. This consciousness helps me very much. And when I keep this awareness, then I'm very free. I fail sometimes, definitely, but it's very free. And then the third thing in terms of during the day, as I move through the day. Let me perform actions in such a way that I'm drawing God's light and light to me. So in other words, my actions are with such a pure motivation, as much as possible without the ego, that that energy, that divine energy, is with me as I move through the day. And that's very, very precious. It's, it's an exchange that's, that's happening. Your thoughts go to God, and it's like God gives you beautiful thoughts in return. And when we keep an elevated consciousness, Magic happens, I don't know what else to say. Things happen, people happen, situations happen. They may be challenging, but you understand what you have to learn and how you can move forward. And that brings you a lot of happiness. One of the things I shared earlier was about trusting and allowing. And as I was sitting, just listening to what's been said and what's been shared, I, I realized I was doing something else that I know for me really kind of um, carries me through a day. And that is to remember to, to give thanks. And I was kind of sitting there just thinking, wow, how kind of special and wonderful the space that we've um, created is. And I was giving thanks for that. So I just, I just wanted to, to share that. I, I have friends who laugh because uh, I'll be saying, oh, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. I might say it quite, quite often um, in a day. But I know that, that what I've done is learned to become conscious, really conscious of, of giving thanks as I go through my day. Because there's certainly been times in my life where I haven't been conscious enough to know, well, to really appreciate what was happening in that moment and be able to give thanks for it. So I was missing a lot of the richness, a lot of the beauty actually taking place in my life at any given time because I was either trying to be someone else or had something going on. Um, so, so for me now to be, to be, to come back at different points and really try and be present and give thanks is definitely a, an important um, I don't know what to call it, but it's important uh, to do that for me. So I just wanted to, to share that. <coughs> I also want to, well, give thanks for what, what we've actually shared as we've gone through the afternoon from when we gathered together in the different things that we've done and for everything that's kind of unfolded in the space. And I'm a spiritual coach and 
um, like do you kind of work with people like helping them to if you like bridge that gap between developing themselves spiritual, spiritually and still moving in the world uh, and how we do that so what I would like to do right now is invite you to reflect for a moment on what we've enjoyed and experienced together and one of the things that I ask um, clients to do sometimes and ask myself to do it is to think of a wow and, and that wow I think for us this afternoon is women of wisdom and everything that we've, we've shared kind of energy wise and, and spiritually and also kind of very practically it stands for within one week so what is it that you're going to take away from our time, from our experience this afternoon? What is it that you're taking away and that you may want to do differently within the next week? I know that when we, when we gather like this, it quite often lots of different things will come up and we hear different things and they trigger different thoughts and, and different ideas and we feel uplifted and we feel inspired and I'm really not saying that this is what anyone here does but there are some people who then go away and they don't do anything else, they don't do anything differently no, not you, but maybe people that you know might do that. So, I'm wondering, do you have one thing to, to focus on and be aware of that you may want to do differently as a result of being here this afternoon? So I'm going to just ask you to think of that for a moment. And then I'm going to invite a couple of people just to share what that is that they're taking on that they're going to do differently within one week. One thing that you do differently, a, a wow. So with anybody who has thought of one thing that they're going to do differently, like to share that with us. Anybody have a wow that they'd like to share? Sharp. 
<laughs> what is it? What is it that you're going to do differently? Um, become more calm. Or... Well, how are you going to do that? <laughs> what is it that you're actually going to do differently? Not get angry. Uh, okay. So you're not going to get angry over the next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Having the aim helps, doesn't it? Why don't we have time for one more? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I liked what was said about um, trying to look through God's eyes and listen for it. And I think you said it was roomy. So I think my. Um, Action from here will get to read Rumi. Thank you. Okay, so the one thing that you may do differently during the week, I mean, I've missed it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.